So, uh, dear colleagues, uh, let me welcome Director Ames and all our colleagues from Ames Delhi, uh, who have kindly consented as National Center of Excellence to take this initiative uh, forward in terms of orienting our medical professionals on the challenges posed by monkeypox disease. Uh, dear colleagues, let me also welcome all of you uh, from our State Center of Excellence as well as uh, also our colleagues from IMA and also from Indian Association of Dermatologists, Venerologists and Laparologists. This is a new challenge posed to us. While we had this ongoing challenge of COVID-19 still in front of us, uh, but uh, parallelly what I would like to also highlight that uh, we feel that we can manage it well if we have correct information and in uh, uh, thinking in that direction only this uh, series of webinars which is being organized Today's topic is uh, on the investigations and diagnosis and uh, for it is important that there are two more uh, video conferences, webinars lined up on this issue. We would request all of you to kindly make best use of it and equally help us in taking this uh, discussion forward by ensuring that the guidelines and the discussion which take place presently can be also disseminated particularly at the cutting edge level. And as another issue which I had mentioned yesterday, I would like to further submit that while we need to be aware, we also need to ensure that there is no unnecessary need to create a panic within the system. We just need to understand what the disease and how to manage it. That is what is the critical element we need to kindly focus on. Uh, so with these words, uh, let me request uh, uh, respected Director Ames to kindly um, take over from here, please. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all the participants, the delegates and the members which have come from the various states, IMA, and the Indian Association for Dermatology and Venerological Diseases. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to these series of webinars being done by the Center of Excellence on Monkeypox Management, being done jointly by the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Uh, yesterday, we had our first webinar, which was on the global burden of disease and epidemiology to give an overview of how uh, monkeypox has evolved since it was first reported in 1958. But I think the most important step is to be able to diagnose the disease and what, how do we do that? So two issues, one of course is how do you collect a sample? What sample should you collect at which stage of the disease as the disease evolves? Uh, when should you take a nasopharyngeal swab? When should you take a uh, swab from the skin lesions? What are the tests that can be done and how do you transport the sample also to the lab so that it can be tested? And what are the tests available both for early diagnosis and maybe a little bit of more detailed uh, tests which are more from the search point of view, which could include electron microscopy or cultures. So a lot of uh, uh, things that one can discuss. So today we are going to discuss investigation and diagnosis and we have Professor Lalitdhar who is the, in, the head uh, in charge of the Department of uh, Virology at the All Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, uh, been doing a lot of work on viral diseases from influenza to COVID-19 and now to monkeypox. And the lab is uh, doing a, taking uh, also accepting samples for monkeypox diagnosis. So he would be giving us an overview of the investigation and diagnosis. And we have then a panel with Dr. Nadmon who was uh, there yesterday also. And Professor Kaushal Verma from the Department of Dermatology, who was also there yesterday. Uh, and of course, the question answer session will be moderated by Dr. Rajiv Kumar, the Associate Dean uh, as far of the All Institute of Medical Sciences. So I would request Dr. Lalitdhar to make his presentation. And after that, we can then uh, have the question answer session. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this uh, session. Uh, I'll go straight to my topic, which is laboratory diagnosis of monkeypox. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many common differential diagnoses which uh, have to be kept in mind. Uh, just for comparison, I have kept smallpox in the table there. Uh, I think probably the clinical aspects uh, may not have been discussed so far uh, there tomorrow, but just as a preliminary uh, guideline here, you have the differences between monkeypox, chickenpox, and smallpox, uh, which all of them belong to the same family. Uh, there is a, a slight difference in the, 
duration of fever, but not, not anything significant. And if you look at the rash in monkeypox, it often starts on the face, spreads to other parts of the body, including palms and soles, and the rash eventually forms a scab that falls off. Uh, I'll come to more details on the lesions then before we go on to the lab diagnosis. Uh, there, there, there is a, a difference from uh, chickenpox there that uh, the uh, chickenpox rash usually starts on the chest and back and face and then spreads over the entire body. It's absent on the palms and soles. Uh, if you look at the uh, involvement of the lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy is a prominent feature of monkeypox. Although it's not there in all cases, but it is uh, there in a large percentage of cases. And that's how, uh, that's one of the ways in which you can differentiate it from chickenpox. And also, uh, when we used to have smallpox, lymph node involvement is not that common. The incubation uh, periods are somewhat similar. There isn't a really a major difference there. And uh, the duration of illness used to be much longer in smallpox than in monkeypox, uh, which is about two to four weeks. Uh, the mortality uh, of the current strain is less than 1%. Uh, in chickenpox, deaths are rare. And in smallpox, it used to go up to even 30%, depending on the type. The other differential diagnoses which, uh, which are there include herpes simplex virus infection, which also produces vesicular rash. Uh, then there is hand, foot, and mouth disease, which is fairly common in uh, uh, young children. And this is due to an enterovirus, uh, which can also uh, be one of the uh, differentials here. And we have been getting cases from uh, both these uh, scenarios as well as from uh, chickenpox, uh, which, you know, which were suspected to be monkeypox, but turned out to be one of these viruses. There are other causes also, which I'm not going into. There's rickettsial pox, there, there are other bacterial infections, et cetera. But uh, usually the, uh, the clinical presentations there are uh, different in many ways. Now the case definition as per the uh, Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare uh, guidelines is uh, any suspected case with a history of travel to affected countries within last 21 days. Now this, uh, I think, uh, because these guidelines were brought out uh, right at the start of the uh, you know, outbreaks, uh, I think this possibly we need not pay too much attention to uh, right now since we are getting cases indigenously and not all of them have a travel history. However, uh, a case with unexplained rash and one or more of the following signs is what was included in the suspected cases, swollen lymph nodes, fever, headache, body aches, and profound weakness. So this is a very wide uh, case definition and I think the intent is not to miss anything. Uh, if we go on to the probable cases, then, you know, uh, there would be some other features that uh, you may find, including uh, confirmed exposure to a known case, etc., uh, or or to the uh, secretions or uh, body fluids of a known case, or to even uh, deformites associated with a known case, like bedding, utensils, etc. So these these uh, help to provide a much stronger epidemiological link. And a confirmed case would be a case that has been confirmed by. Uh, real-time PCR or sequencing. So this was the ministry's definition. And then uh, you have the CDC's uh, definition from the US, uh, which says new characteristic rash. Uh, and they have defined the characteristics. I'll come to some of those. Meets one of the epidemiological criteria and has a high clinical suspicion and, and, and so on. And then, uh, you know, a probable case becomes one which has no suspicion of other recent orthoparts virus infections. Uh, so vaccinia, et cetera, because they, they have been using the vaccine there, especially for healthcare work, some healthcare workers and high risk people in the laboratories, et cetera. Uh, uh, but along with that, orthopox virus DNA and orthopox, uh, other evidences of orthopox virus. Uh, and the confirmed case would obviously be not just orthopox, but also monkeypox uh, virus DNA by real-time PCR or NGS or isolation in culture. I'm not going into isolation of monkey fox virus in culture uh, in my presentation. Uh, it, is a, it is available at the National Institute of Virology uh, because for culture and for, uh, you know, other manipulation of cultured material like, uh, you know, uh, uh, electron microscopy, etc. You need a, a high level of biosafety. And uh, right now, these are restricted to the National Institute of Virology in India. Uh, there are some epidemiological criteria, as I mentioned, uh, which are mostly uh, either travel to a known country, etc., even in the CDC guidelines, or direct contact with a known case. 
uh, and then they have some exclusion criteria that is basically if there's any other illness with, uh, that that uh, can explain the presentation uh, or if rash does not develop within five days of onset that is also an exclusion criteria according to cbc now this this is just to give you some details of the kind of lesions that you may um, would like to look for firm or rubbery lesions well circumscribed deep seated often develop umbilication that is a kind of a dot on the top and you can see it in uh, one of the pictures there very very clearly uh, the because 98 percent of all cases as per who right now are from uh, the uh, from men who have sex with men uh, there are a lot of lesions in the genital and you know rectal regions uh, right now uh, in the cases uh, that even in some of the cases from India, these have been seen. And these uh, are not always, the lesions are not always disseminated across many sites in the body. They may be confined to uh, certain areas uh, or may be confined even to a few lesions or a single lesion sometimes. And they do not always appear on palms or soles. Uh, so this is just to keep in mind the current outbreak because that used to be one of the ways to dis 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 uh, discriminate it from other uh, similar uh, differential diagnoses, but it, it's not always true in this case. Uh, similarly, uh, as I mentioned, even lymphadenopathy may or may not be there, uh, but, but it would be there in a large proportion. Uh, typically, the lesions develop simultaneously and they evolve together on any given part of the body and they progress through four stages, macular, papular, vesicular to pustular, before they scab over and desquamate. And the lesions are often described by the patient as being painful until healing. Once it starts healing, then they become itchy and uh, you can see the crust formation, etc. Now, how to go about uh, collecting the sample? The integrated disease surveillance program staff in the state or district must be informed about any suspected case before, before collecting any samples. This is uh, necessary because we, just, we don't just want to diagnose it, but also ensure contact tracing, isolation, etc. And uh, this uh, is, is an important thing. Also, you can get a lot of guidance from the IDSP personnel uh, for, uh, for the collection itself and also for shortlisting the, uh, whether it is uh, fitting into the case definition properly or not. Uh, we have in, at AIMS been receiving samples from uh, various states, including uh, Haryana, Himachal, adjoining parts of UP, Bihar, et cetera. And, uh, we, and the uh, IDSP people have been coordinating a lot of these activities. Uh, the sample is to be collected wearing full PPE and that includes gloves, gown, head and eye cover. And eye cover, et cetera, is also important here because uh, aerosol uh, transmission and even, you know that it, it can be transmitted uh, through the respiratory route. The viral load in the lesions is very high and uh, one would not want to take any chances with it. Uh, sterile Dacron nylon or polyester swab should be used. Cotton swab should not be used for collection. Uh, the dry swabs from the lesions uh, are to be collected in plain tubes. Uh, the nasopharyngeal swabs in viral transport medium, blood in plain, that is yellow top containers, and in EDTA, that is lavender top uh, containers, uh, and urine in plain tubes. All tubes should be sterile and screw capped. Uh, the monkeypox skin lesion material should be collected from more than one lesion, preferably. So two or more lesions of the same type should be collected in a single tube, preferably from different body locations. But do not mix the type of sample. That is, as per the NIV guidelines, that if you are collecting surface samples, please put all the surface samples together. If you are collecting the vesicular fluid, please put all the vesicular fluids uh, collected from various lesions together. And, and so on. And the other samples that you can take apart from the, uh, the swab from the lesion surface and the, uh, the exudate or the vesicular fluid is, you can take the roof of the lesion. If it is, you can, uh, if you, if, if it is deroofing or something, you can, uh, you know, take the whole roof or you can take the crust. Uh, and uh, in the NIV guidelines, they also mention from the base, but uh, most people, uh, most other guidelines don't mention it. Uh, it would be valuable, but uh, the thing is one has to also ensure safety and uh, the more you manipulate the lesions, the more the chances of, uh, uh, you know, the risk increases. So I think uh, these are the uh, common fluids uh, the, and, and uh, material that should be taken. Uh, in the uh, testing, we are, have been uh, advised by NIV to first prioritize the lesion material. 
That means that the other samples that you se uh, send will be set aside. We will aliquot them, and in case, uh, uh, and, and this is primarily for NIV to further follow up in case required. Similar sample, uh, so so swabs from each location, as I said, should be collected in separate tubes, and these should not be mixed. When I say location, it means uh, uh, from each type of sample, rather, I should say. Now, how are you going to? Now, this is a category A pathogen, and uh, the uh, uh, the packing is, and I think now most people are familiar with the packing. It has to be a triple layer packing. Uh, in uh, the first one, of course, has to be the sample vial. Please ensure proper labeling of the vials, uh, and uh, must ensure that there is no leakage. So it should be sealed properly, the primary vial. And then the primary vial goes into a sturdy leak-proof secondary container. And then uh, you can use either the cryo box as a secondary container, or you can use a larger, say, a 50 ml centrifuge tube, or what we call the Falcon tube as a secondary container. And you can, uh, again, uh, you have to ensure proper sealing. And, and then it goes into a, uh, an outer container. You, you can put it in a Ziploc pouch also as the outer container, but then you have to uh, transport it uh, uh, in a thermocol box with uh, all the proper labeling, etc. What is important is also to fill this form, and ICMR NIV has uh, dispersed this form uh, to all to the IDSP. IDSP is also using the same form, and this should be filled carefully and properly uh, because uh, in the long run we are interested in also. Uh, seeing how our cases are behaving and also this is important for the contract tracing and other uh, activities. So please fill the form carefully and properly. Now, as I said, it is a category A pathogen. So this is about uh, the test that we carry out in India is the monkeypox real-time PCR. Uh, it's a category A pathogen that is important for IATA for shipping. So all the any shipping through any courier would uh, need to specify this. The sample is hand, handled, uh, it has to be handled in a BSL-2 facility once it comes to the lab, following BSL-3 precautions. Uh, and it is, and this is for uh, this is for the sample processing, nucleic acid extraction, and testing. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we do not handle uh, for culture uh, or other uh, tests uh, in a BSL-2 facility. That has to be done in higher level facilities. Uh, two separate real-time PCR reactions are set up in the laboratory on the extracted DNA, uh, a non-variola orthopox virus generic real-time PCR, and a monkeypox specific PCR. We put them up in parallel, but they have to be put up on uh, separate instruments because they use the same set of dyes. So two parallel equipments, if the lab does not have a parallel equipment, then they would uh, run it in a series, start with the orthopox one, and then go on to the monkeypox one, but both have to be put up. The, the uh, kits also contain, which are the kits that are supplied by National Institute of Virology uh, to the uh, designated labs, also contain primers and probes for the RNASP, which is the host housekeeping gene target. And uh, this is an internal control to ensure that the sample quality and the DNA extraction has been uh, adequate. Uh, so on the right side, you see two pictures. Uh, one, the first one is of the orthopox uh, generic PCR, and the second one of the monkeypox specific PCR from a couple of uh, positive samples that we got in our lab recently. NIV Pune, which is the nodal laboratory, uh, uh, and along with that, 15 other laboratories have been designated by ICMR for monkeypox testing. This provide, this uh, slide provides you all the details for, their, for the contact persons, their mobile numbers, their email addresses, and uh, Ames Delhi is one of the laboratories which is doing the testing. Uh, the algorithm from ICMR, uh, as you can see, I have already mentioned uh, the first two tests that are put up, the orthopox generic and the uh, monkeypox uh, specific PCR. Uh, but if it is negative in the uh, first PCR, then uh, ICMR also advises that in case the uh, uh, concerned uh, referring uh, physician, clinician, uh, or epidemiologist feels that it might be HSV, VZV, or enteroviruses, one of the enteroviruses, then uh, essentially uh, what we mean by that is whether it's a case of herpes simplex virus infection or zoster or a suspected zoster or chickenpox or a case of suspected hand, foot and mouth disease, then even these are provided by the 15 uh, 
uh, by the 16 laboratories which have been identified. If it happens to be positive in the monkeypox PCR, then we report it from the individual laboratories. But we also refer uh, an aliquot, uh, some aliquots to the ICMR and IV Pune uh, for further, uh, uh, no longer for confirmation because this algorithm is slightly wrong. So the report from the 15 labs is considered as a confirmed report, but it goes to NIV for other uh, testing and uh, sequencing and so on. And isolation also, they, they are uh, performing. So all kinds of characterization is done at NIV Pune. Uh, these are some of the alternative primers and probes which have been uh, used across uh, other countries. This is the protocol of the CDC. Again, you'll see, you'll find a monkeypox virus generic PCR, which is uh, specific for monkeypox uh, viruses. Actually, they call it generic because you know it, it covers all the monkeypox strains. There are multiple clades. I'll just come briefly to those also. Uh, and also contains, as you see in our own protocols, the uh, human uh, DNA control. Uh, the primers from CDC are based on the DNA polymerase gene of the monkeypox virus. Uh, NIV has not given the details of their primers. Uh, so we, but we presume that they would be similar targets. Alternate gene targets for real-time PCR that have been reported in literature include uh, envelope protein genes and clade-specific PCRs are also available, which is why we dif differentiate the monkeypox generic from the clade-specific PCRs. Uh, uh, the, I'll, I'll come to the clades uh, later. They, uh, in uh, 2017, there was also a publication of the evaluation of some of the near point-of-care platforms. Uh, for monkeypox diagnosis. And as we have seen in uh, COVID-19 uh, diagnosis, these turned out to be uh, quite useful, uh, especially for, you know, at the grassroots, uh, you know, close to the grassroots level and uh, for individual cases, uh, because the test that we do mostly, if you have large numbers, then batching has to be done. Otherwise, there's a lot of wastage of consumables. So these are available and I'm sure there must be indigenous uh, manufacturers also working on similar platforms already, uh, trying to develop them in case the numbers increase, et cetera. Uh, some of the high throughput platforms, uh, which uh, were also obtained by the ministry and by our individual institutions uh, for uh, uh, coronavirus testing, like uh, the, the some of the systems, the high throughput platforms have also been evaluated uh, for monkeypox uh, diagnosis. So if, if required and if the numbers really increase, these can be put into use. Uh, this is just to mention the clades because uh, since I've uh, talked about them, uh, you know, there, there are two known, there, there have been two known clades of monkeypox virus based on genetic sequencing. The Central African clade uh, from the Congo Basin has a higher uh, case fatality rate and uh, it, uh, it comes in clade one. Uh, clade 2 was the West African one, which had a lower uh, uh, case fatality rate uh, due to the absence of a virus complement control protein. This protein actually used to inhibit uh, complement, uh, the complement system in the human host. And uh, because this is absent due to a, a deletion in the gene, uh, in the genome of this uh, West African clade, uh, it actually has a lower virulence. Uh, the uh, the current one uh, is basically now uh, put in a separate clade, clade three, and it clusters with some of the latter period cases from West Africa. So it also has a low mortality, as I mentioned. The case fatality rate is definitely less than one person. In fact, there are only a handful of deaths reported. For example, from India, out of the nine cases reported, only one uh, mortality was there. But that is because we have very small numbers. Uh, if you look at the initial data of WHO, and I think around 16,000 cases, there were just five deaths. So really speaking, it would be extremely low, the risk of mortality. And the reason why this, one of the things that was noted uh, during the uh, phylogenetic studies and sequencing was that the host, uh, one of the host genes activities, uh, which uh, can induce hypermutation in this strain. Otherwise, DNA viruses are generally not known to mutate very actively and rapidly, uh, unlike the RNA viruses. But in this case, one of the host uh, en uh, enzymes is inducing hypermutation, which kind of indicates that this virus is already fairly well adapted to the human host. Uh, 
which of course is a question mark how that has happened and uh, when and where. Thank you. So uh, now I think we yeah, can pass thank you very much. And, uh, I think uh, thanks to Dr. Lalitdar, you've got a broad overview of the investigation and diagnosis. What should you do to get a definite diagnosis? Uh, two or three things that I would just like to point out. Uh, one, of course, was which is important from a clinician point of view is when should you take which sample? And we the disease goes through what is known as a primary viremic stage and a secondary viremic stage during the incubation period. It starts as a nasopharyngeal infection with the draining lymph nodes becoming enlarged. There is viremia with uh, the lymphoreticular system getting involved. And subsequently, there occurs these rash and the subsequent features. So in the early stage, uh, when you have the incubation period, obviously no test is going to be positive. You are asymptomatic. In the early stage, when you have fever, then the nasopharyngeal swab would be what you need to take. And then once the rash happens, you need to take that. So it's important for clinicians to understand what sample to take when. And I think that is an important issue. Maybe Lalit would just like to... Uh, because I think... Yes, it's sir. Uh, sir, it's a very, very valid point, sir. Uh, the reason why I uh, did not uh, dwell on that too much was that... Uh, uh, actually, as of now, most of the suspicion starts once the rash is already there. Uh, uh, but uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, the nasopharyngeal sw swabs are useful in the early, uh, very early stages of the infection. Uh, and uh, in fact, if it is very late, which is actually happening in some of the cases that they come very late and the scab is already formed and there the blood sample comes in uh, useful also sometimes and uh, the... Uh, so the so the, as uh, as per the guidelines, we are supposed to collect all the samples, mm -hmm. uh, and we have left it to the laboratory as well as to later on an IV to choose what they want to use. But they have asked us to prioritize the samples from the lesions. Correct. So I think the point that I was really trying to highlight was that in case you have someone who has a close contact with a person with monkeypox, a healthcare worker, and he has fever and symptoms, it may be worthwhile to take the sample a nasopharyngeal sample there and then rather than wait for the rash to develop and have classical features. So that is important to keep in mind. The other issues which, which are, I think we can have the question also, just uh, the other thing that I wanted, a little clarification, two points from uh, uh, Dr. Lalit. One was that you had shown one test and then the other test. If the first test is negative, can we rule out that this is not monkeypox and do we need to do the second PCR? Because that also covers monkeypox. It covers the orthopox virus as a whole. So if you do, do we still need to do the monkeypox or can we say that it is negative and it may not be required just as a, uh, just for clarification? Sir, uh, sir, theoretically, that would be the right approach. But epidemiologically, I think they want us to give the diagnosis as fast as possible. So they have, as of now, advised us to do both the tests uh, okay. test together, sir. Because if your first test is positive, then you want to be more specific and you could look for monkeypox. If the first test, which is for orthopox virus, is negative, then it rules out cowpox, it rules out monkeypox and others. Absolutely. So it may... Absolutely. It may sometimes be better to do it in sequence rather than parallels if you have resource constraints. Finally, my final question that I wanted to ask you before I ask Rajiv to take over is the role of antibody testing. Like you said, you can take blood samples. Is there a role of doing antibody testing in, let's say, the exposed people or healthcare workers to see for the antibodies? And will that really help from the epidemiological point of view? And also the urine. Uh, and the uh, 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 these, uh, it's a good question, but as of now, there aren't any reliable tests for measuring the antibodies in the blood or the urine. Uh, that's why we don't but have too much on that. It, it could IGN, evolve over time. IGN. Yes, sir. So antibody testing may evolve as we are also looking at a rapid point of care test, which may also uh, evolve in terms of uh, uh, rapid diagnosis. See, that is, yes, that is that very much there, and that is this, for the correct. lesions themselves. You can. You see, a lot of these tests had been looked at because of outbreaks happening in Africa. There was an outbreak in Nigeria also in 2017, and of course, the outbreak in the US. But uh, because the number of cases globally are not that many, this has never been looked at from the commercial point of view. It may change now, and therefore, we may have antibody-based testing, and we may have antigen-based point-of-care testing also, which are available. But these are important issues. But two points that I wanted to make was, in a strong, in a case with strong suspicion, don't wait for the rash. You can still do a nasopharyngeal swab and send it. 
and especially if there's a history of contact with them exactly case, so, so if you have a healthcare worker who has come in contact and we said that this could be a probable case because he was not wearing a full ppe then if he has fever it's worthwhile just to take the rash rather take the sample rather than to wait for the rash to happen so that was something that i wanted to make a point in and of course although the tests are said to be done in parallel logically it seems better if they are done in sequence yes. over to you rajiv now you can just see the questions which are there on the chat box and we can try and answer them thank you sir we have a few questions in the chat box i just like to remind everybody who is attending that attendees should post their questions in the chat box rather than chat box rather than raising their hands because they cannot be brought on live onto the platform on the other hand the panelists can raise their hand switch on their camera and they can ask the questions live so for the attendees please post your questions in the chat box we cannot bring you on live so the one of the questions here is again about sample collection and transportation so it says should it be with a vtm or should it be without a vtm so uh, the reason why uh, clinical lesion samples are without vtm with a dry swab is that the viral load is very high there and you don't want to have anything that can generate an aerosol uh, the virus is uh, numbers are not that high in uh, nasopharyngeal swabs so that is recommended to be collected in vtm yeah maybe you can just clarify although i think people should know this why don't we use a cotton swab so this is something that is so the cotton swab actually inhibits uh, the, the the material can inhibit uh, on one side the real time pcr itself to some extent uh, and uh, more more importantly if you want to if an iv intends to grow the virus it becomes uh, deterrent so that's why we don't use cotton swabs okay right, so the question answer is very clear here that if it's an esophageal swab which is what the question was it should be with a vtm yes and the urine is just as such in a sterile container uh, that doesn't need anything else just should be in a screw cap sterile container right sir uh, the next question was about the form that the icmr nib has does it need to be sent with the sample or does the physician supposed to keep it so the form usually we is sent with the sample uh, but it should be outside of the triple pack yeah so if you saw the box the triple bag you would see that there was a sort of plastic bag and a, a, a paper was kept inside it so the form has to be sent along with the sample and it should be kept outside the sample uh, in in a plastic bag which you can tape on to the box but that has to be sent uh, uh, yes uh, with the samples so, so that the data is there both you see it's not only the sample it's the clinical epidemiological profile also which is important for the uh, NIV and ICMR to be able to understand and and uh, uh, sometimes it happens that the because as i said idsp has to be in the loop uh, for this and uh, sometimes the idsp personnel of the state will send it by other means email whatsapp etc the form uh, in advance so that we can take a look at it so but yes it has to come i think that's important uh, before we go to the next question i'll just ask my panelists if uh, dr prashant verma has anything to say about the skin lesions and anything about the sampling there yeah i think the good time for collecting the skin lesion has been found to be are reported to be say starting from fourth day of start of the rash and then we for rather one week and the vesicular fluid has been shown to be producing the best uh, the test results yeah so the so, question that i yeah. wanted to ask you was should, can we use a needle to aspirate yeah, the fluid that is, that's, that's the way so, that is, that is what we so, need sir, to get a clarification uh, on yes so uh, two things here one um, the guidelines uh, mention that any stage of lesions should be sampled whether it is vesicular or maculopapular but we do know that with the maculopapular uh, you will get uh, poorer uh, yield and uh, therefore it it may actually turn out negative sometimes uh, the vesicular one is the best sample as dr verma just pointed out uh, so your question the needle ah so so the uh, the uh, ministry guidelines don't mention any syringe or needle but the niv guidelines definitely mention that the vesicular fluid is best collected with a syringe and a needle and or uh, you should take it from multiple vesicles and pull it in the same tube so if you have vesicles which has fluid in that then sometime it may be a simpler thing just to take a fine needle and puncture that and aspirate the fluid from multiple sites and then send that yeah i think this is yeah, what we yeah, you yeah. trying to highlight maybe the strap and the scab they have the poor yield so if you have the active lesion the vesicular lesion that would be the best stage to sample 
And Dr. Anand, anything about the nasopharyngeal swab? It's a similar way of taking it as we do for COVID-19? Yeah, more or less similar. And I think as Dr. Lalit has already said that uh, that goes uh, with the VTM and the, the, uh, the skin lesions can go separately because the load is pretty high in that. But by and large, the collection technique, I think, is remain more or less the same. And Okay. Uh, one more thing, just, uh, just uh, from, from both uh, Dr. Kaushal uh, Burma and uh, Lalit, what about fomites? If you have scabs which have fallen off, is there any point in sending them or uh, from the from surfaces, from bed sheets? And do you think they will have a yield or you should take it directly from the patient's uh, lesion itself? Uh, in fact, as we have seen that the scabs are the fomite fallen material, they would have very poor yield. So if you have a patient with active lesions, sample the active lesion. The infectivity from these materials have also been found to be very low, but they do contain the viral DNA. So there is a possibility. But uh, if you have the choice of between the collection, the fomite and the, the stem material, which has fallen on the beddings or maybe the pillow or the linen, I think it would be better to take it from the patient rather than from the material, which is... So I think what... The, Again, I'll ask Lalit first. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, so the scab could yield the viral, viral DNA, uh, we, we, uh, but it would be much lesser than vesicles. Uh, so in case there's nothing else, yes, the, uh, the scabs can be picked up from the uh, bedding or wherever and be sent. Uh, the other option is that blood should be taken because some amount of viremia sometimes persists, so you might be able to find some evidence in the blood itself. Correct. So I think the point that... I was trying to highlight is that it's important to understand that fomites can be a source of infection. You So you have to have good infection control measures even when it comes to beddings and fomites and the, let's say, the towel that the patient uses and other things. But they have a low viral load and therefore for picking up for diagnosis, it's better to take it directly from the patient rather than fomites. Although, as Dr. Lalder mentioned, if you have no other way, then fomites can be used or a blood sample can also be taken. Over to you, Rajiv. Not the fomites, but the scab. The scab. The scab. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I mean the scab on the fomites. Yes. <laughs> let's let's put it this way: the yeah. scab on the fomites. Yeah. The fallen material from the lesions. The fallen material which lies on the bedding or on the towel or on on the bed on the let's say pillow cover, you can use that. That can also give you a diagnosis, but the viral load is much less. So there's a panelist who has raised their hand. If they wish to ask a question, can you open your camera and introduce yourself because the name doesn't appear. Okay, there are two. Okay, uh, my name is Dr. Raji from Dr. Raji from Kerala. Uh, uh, varicella being the closest to differential, uh, would you say, uh, advise to take the samples and start acyclovir or would you advise any other tests also? So the question is whether we should start acyclovir or antiviral if we think this could be varicella. Yes, of course. I mean, if you think it's varicella, you have to give a high dose uh, course of uh, antivirals. Acyclovir is a very safe drug. I don't think it should do any acyclovir harm. Acyclovir or dancyclovir can be given. Varma is the expert on this, I think. No, I think if you have a very high index of suspicion of varicella and you want to rule out or maybe the equal index of suspicion between the chicken pox and the varicella infection and the monkey pox, then you can start a cyclovir. There's no harm. Yeah. It depends on your clinical judgment. So it's a clinical judgment and you must uh, base your diagnosis on clinical judgment. I would say that the chances of it being varicella in the current scenario are much higher than it being monkeypox. Absolutely. As was mentioned by Dr. Lalit, there are two or three important things. The rash appears much more earlier. In varicella, it takes almost five days to appear in monkeypox. It takes, it takes a little longer. Lymph nodes are not usually seen in varicella. They are usually seen when it comes to monkeypox. And the lesions that the rash that you see in monkeypox classically also involves the palms and the soles, which usually does not happen when it, you're talking of varicella. So these are some clinical sort of uh, markers which may help you. But if you have a doubt that this could be varicella, it's worthwhile to give the patient the benefit of the doubt and start on treatment uh, with acyclovir. Uh, rather than wait too long because the efficacy is dependent on how early you started. Anything else? Or we there is another hand Hello. which I panelist Dr. Rajita Aluri who has raised uh, hand if they want to ask a question. 
good afternoon sir i am dr rajita luri assistant professor at jsl medical college uh, department of tvl uh, sir uh, can we do biopsy in case of skin lesions of monkey pox and does histopathology reveal any specific pathology sir yes there are okay <laughs> no no sir pathology no no there are there are bio pathology which has been done biopsy has also been taken but the diagnosis is predominantly based on showing the virus either by pcr yeah i think it does not indicate towards any specific histopathological changes which differentiates says this monkey pox from the other cytopathological changes which appear in the skin so it's not helpful in the diagnosis of monkey pox as such okay sir thank and, you and uh, to take the first part of your question uh, surface swabs are what are recommended uh, in case it's a maculopapular lesion they are just trying to avoid too much manipulation because the risk of uh, uh, you know infection etc for the person who's collecting it so by and large avoidable at least for the primary level diagnosis uh, i there are some more questions in the chat box uh, uh, dr rajiv should i take them uh, sure. One, yeah. one of course she's already put it up to us she's uh, i think uh, dr samiksha has also asked us how soon can we expect results for the sample sent so if we get it uh, say in the first half of the day then we give it the same day otherwise definitely within 24 hours at the end of the day it's a real time pcr so a lot of, sometimes we get samples very late at night so then we do it the next morning but uh, within 24 hours is definitely so done. i think the bottom line is you'll get your result early within 24 hours sometimes even in within the same day if the sample comes early so don't get worried that it will take too long for the results to come so then there's another question which are, uh, which is about it says enterococcus i presume they mean enterovirus yes we do the test we we uh, icmr has also sent us kits for testing for enteroviruses we were also doing it at aims earlier but they have also sent us uh, varicella zoster virus and uh, herpes simplex virus so yes those are available at all the 15 laboratories in case you uh, want the uh, diagnosis to be done the laboratory will do it for you subsequent to ruling out monkey pox okay rajiv any other question so there is a question also on the fna of lymph nodes uh, for pcr so should you do an fna and do a pcr on the fna to sample from lymph nodes see uh, one the the virus may well be there but as of now no biopsy or fnc is recommended for a routine diagnosis i think the yield is not that much the lymph node enlargement is more reactive you may have some degree of virus in it but i'm not sure uh, what is the yield in terms of sensitivity and specificity if any of the panelists have an idea on this you can Uh, no, and idea. usually, you know, you'll have lesions when you have the lymphadenopathy. So why would you yeah. go for a lymph yeah. node aspiration when you can simply take the sample from the lesion okay. where the virus is in huge numbers? Mostly a reactive lymph node. Analysis. Yeah, mm-hmm. true. It's too difficult to aspirate lymph nodes and taking a sample from the skin lesion, mm-hmm. or maybe from the no, blood or the urine. It should be. Is it? Will it give you a higher yield as compared yeah. to the skin lesion? So I don't think there's oh. enough data one way or the other, but unlikely. Not likely. The next question again on sampling is in the papular or macular stage. Can we also include blood in the scrapings? Yeah, we don't have a problem with blood being there in the scraping. Uh, no problem at all. If uh, inevitably there'll be some blood there, and we don't have a problem with that. But for the macular and papular ones, we they have said surface swabs. They have not really recommended scraping. So the scrapings are mainly for the. I mean, if you are de-roofing a vesicle, or uh, you know, you are taking a scraping from the base of a vesicle, that's where the scraping really comes in. But if they just have maculopapular lesions, I don't think you no know, anybody is recommending uh, any scraping. We have a couple of questions that are actually on clinical management, but since we don't have any other questions on diagnosis, maybe we can take one or two. Although we are discussing clinical management tomorrow, mm-hmm. so one of the questions is on the role of valcyclovir in the treatment. Uh, currently, vancyclovir has no role in the treatment of monkeypox. There is no data to support its use, and that's why we we said that if you have a doubt of varicella infection, you could look at antivirals. Otherwise, uh, vancyclovir, gancyclovir don't have any role as far as monkeypox is concerned. I lost our caution for my fears. Anything to add on that? Not not really. We don't have the data. The 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 research uh, does not indicate that these uh, particular agents are effective. 
So we'll have to wait and see as soon. Cytophobia has been found. Cytophobia. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the other drugs might also. But valcyclovir, acyclovir, I think these drugs, by the sheer, uh, you know, the, prin the principle behind the mechanism of action, they are unlikely to work. The so enzymes are very. Specific. Most drugs which have been show have been approved by the FDA for use are the ones which are actually effective against smallpox or had been shown to be useful against smallpox. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. And although data for as far as monkeypox is concerned is not very strong, uh, we have uh, vincidofivir also, which is there, and ticovirimat is also there. But uh, these drugs are not freely available. And as per the uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guidelines, it's predominantly a symptomatic support which is required rather than antiviral treatment. But we'll discuss this tomorrow. And it's basically a self-limiting disease. Correct. Right. So the next question is about isolation and hospitalization. Do you need to isolate them till you get the test results? Although you've said you get the results in 24 hours, but in that period, do they need to be isolated? Yes, if you have a strong suspicion, you must isolate them. This is the same principle that we follow for all uh, infectious diseases, including COVID-19, that you will isolate, presumed to be positive unless, uh, unless shown otherwise. Hospital-based Hospital isolation may not be no. necessary. Home-based uh, isolation. Hospitalization may not be essential, but isolation yeah, definitely is. Hospitalization is not essential for all of these patients. We are not in that current situation. Home isolation can be done, and those guidelines are also there, which we will discuss, mm -hmm. I think, on, this, on, on the 17th of August regarding uh, home isolation. But broadly, the principle remained the same as it was for COVID-19 in terms of home isolation and infection control, both from patient point of view and the um, uh, healthcare provider or the, or the person looking after that patient is concerned. So Dr. Anuja George is a panelist. She wanted to say something. Adam, you can turn on your mic. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Anuja. I'm the professor and head of the Department of Dermatology from Trivandrum, Kerala. And uh, I happen to be the person who has seen the first case of monkeypox in India, or rather in, even in Southeast Asia. So I just wanted to make a few comments. Uh, we saw this patient on the seventh day of his uh, symptoms, that is from fever. And uh, on the seventh day, we collected all the samples from blood, from urine, from the nasopharyngeal swab, as well as the skin lesions. We took three skin lesions and we took uh, the samples from the roof, from the fluid and or the exudate and from the base and it was positive in all the cases. And uh, this remained so to the first day we sent about 12 samples, the three blood, urine, nasopharyngeal and then the three into three lesions. So this turned out to be positive even on the 14th day of symptoms, that is the seventh day of our ad admission. And uh, it remained positive even on the, uh, I mean, it became negative only on the 18th day of symptoms. So I just wanted to make a comment that even the urine was positive in this patient. Uh, unfortunately, even though we tried to get, a, this was a male patient, we tried to get his semen for testing, but he refused because it said that it can remain positive even for a little longer than the other samples. So I just wanted to make a comment that even the urine can be collected if you cannot get the other samples. How right. sick, Thank you. Uh, how sick was this patient and how many skin lesions did he have? He had very few lesions. It was less than 20. I think it was, uh, count we counted it was about 18 lesions. Okay. And which sites predominantly affected? Uh, Actually, this patient came with extensive oral lesions. So we thought it was slightly different from the so far reported cases. But and, uh, this patient turned out to be, uh, he was tested positive even for HSV 1 and 2, IgG and IgM. And he responded well to the acyclovir also. So the oral lesions subsided really fast. So that was the most prominent feature. But he had just one or two lesions on the genitalia and very discreet spaced out uh, skin lesions, which occurred on the face, on his, I mean, on the forehead, on his ears, on his shoulders, on his chest, arms, palms, and hands. Those are the hands. So it was really spaced out. Uh, you can't say there was a uh, localization or more of these lesions were present on one side. Like they say, there's a centrifugal uh, spread of the lesions. 
but you couldn't make that out because it was so few in number. Thank okay. you. So I think you made two or three very important points. One is that the person continues to be infectious for a longer period of time and therefore isolation needs to be much longer than what we've done yes. for other uh, illnesses and possibly up to three weeks. And yes. that is something that we need to keep in mind because they can still be uh, infectious and spread the disease even through the scabs which form. And until all the scabs have fallen off and uh, they've healed, the patient should be considered infectious and be kept in isolation. So I think that is an important issue to keep in mind. The data that you said is important in terms of uh, secretions, uh, the uh, semen, even uh, 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 urine and uh, tears also. And this is something which we need to, we need more uh, data on. I, I remember we had one patient who came with Ebola many years ago and he had come from Sierra Leone, he was negative. But his semen sample continued to be positive for RT-PCR for Ebola even after three months. Oh, and he yeah. was asymptomatic, but he was in isolation in the airport hospital for three months because his RT-PCR continued to be positive and we weren't sure whether this is live or dead virus and what to do, but we couldn't send him uh, for three months uh, outside. So it's important research question as to how long does the virus stay in certain secretions, including semen. And it may be worthwhile to try and answer that as if we get more cases, because hopefully we should infectious. not. That will, that I think, sir, be... Yes, please. I think it would be nice to do serial testing. You know, we did it on the 7th, 11th, 14th, 18th, and 23rd days. Yes. So that's yeah. how we... So, so NIV is following up with the positive cases. Uh, they directly follow up with the clinician and they ask them to ship samples at regular intervals until the oh. patient is still there. Oh. Yeah, but samples should also include areas where you, the virus may stay for a longer period of time. And like you said, it could be a semen sample, and especially even since we're talking of a number of, uh, a larger number of people who are, who are being reported with having, uh, in the group of men having sex with men, it may be something yes, that we yes. need to keep in mind. Thank you very much. Thank Rajiv, you, sir. So we just have one more question, sir. That is again clinical, but I suppose we can take it because we still have the time to do it. How would you differentiate a vesicobullous lesion in general from monkeypox? Monkey How will you differentiate a vesicobullous lesion with uh, and um, monkeypox? Um, okay, Dr. The, the monkeypox lesion have classically been described as well-circumscribed lesions. They would start on the skin surface. And then over the period of time, in the next about two to three days, they will become papular lesion. And then they would become vesicular. And in our, on our, after another four or five days, they will become postular lesions, which will persist for another week or 10 days. So these are the lesions. It depends on which phase, phase of evolution you're looking at. And most of the times when you were looking at these lesions, they would be either in the papular phase of the disease or in the vesicular phase or maybe the later one. So well circumscribed lesion, relatively larger lesion on the exposed sites primarily, but they could occur elsewhere on the body. And there is a central omplication that would start from the vesicular stage of the disease. And then when the crusting occurs, the, that implication might still show in the center. And the crust, the heaped up crust will show in the periphery. So you can differentiate, but you know, some lesions of the, the varicella can look very similar to this. So you have to be careful that yes, but these lesions are relatively deeper and they are more uh, say indurated. Whereas in chickenpox, you have relatively superficial lesions. So there's a clinical possibility that you will be able to differentiate, but sometimes it may be difficult because atypical presentations have been seen in many of these patients which are very close or mimicus to other uh, vesicolobulous regions. I think there are two important questions, Rajiv, you can take them and- maybe Yeah, so two questions on testing. One, are they only in government institutions? So people in the private sector, if they want to get a test done, how do they get it done? And how much does it cost? Yeah, so it's free of cost because uh, the government is uh, uh, giving it free of cost to us and it is free of cost for the patient. Uh, yes, private institutions, we have received samples from private institutions and they also need to get in touch with the local IDSP and through them, uh, the collection can happen and uh, they'll advise them also about how to collect, et cetera, and uh, help to get the samples to the labs. Right, sir. So as of now, it's not being done in private laboratories. It's already, already being done in accredited. No, no only... 
not in private laboratories. No, it's being done only in 16 laboratories in India. I've already put the list up in my presentation. Right, sir. So we've reached the end of the questions for today, sir. If you'd like to sum up for the day. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think uh, very important uh, points came up. One, of course, was the fact that how do you take a sample and what should you do and how do you send it in various uh, uh, vials and the uh, collection of the sample, which was shown very aptly. This is also available on the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare website on monkeypox uh, management. But the important issue is that in the early stage, when you have a high patient with fever and high index of suspicion, take a nasopharyngeal swab. If you have a skin lesion and others, then you take all swabs, including a blood sample and a urine sample. But in the early stage, if there's a high index of suspicion, you must also take a nasopharyngeal swab. Dr. Lalidhar put up a list. Uh, you could have a look at that again. It's also available again on the website of all the centers which are, the, uh, are doing testing for monkeypox. You should note down the center which is closer to your area and the contact number is also there. With the help of the IDSP, you can send samples and like uh, it was mentioned... The IDSP the, linkages are there on the NCDC side. So the IDSP linkages are also there on the NCDC side and uh, they will also help you as far as the sample is concerned and this test is free and done uh, uh, in all these laboratories. So if the suspicion is high, contact the IDSP, contact the lab in that area and get the test done. And during that period, the patient should be isolated till you are sure one way or the other whether this is monkeypox or not. The other issue is if you are thinking of that this could be varicella, then you can start antiviral in the form of acyclovir uh, rather than wait for the report and that gets delayed. Uh, I think these were the main issues that we uh, wanted to cover today in terms of testing. The, the uh, important issue, of course, is the flow of tests that was shown by Dr. Lindhar, uh, how it's done and how it gets reported in terms of an RT-PCR test. And the result is usually available in less than 24 hours. So don't worry that you'll take too long for to get your results. Uh, anything else from the panelists' point of view? So uh, finally, if there's any comments from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, This is Dr. Pradeep Patanavi, sir. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful presentations, Dr. Lalit. And, sir, thanks to each of the faculty members who joined and who helped us to know in a better way regarding their laboratory and their clinical features for monkeypox. Thank you all. And thanks for all the participants and the experts who had joined this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll meet again tomorrow at 3 and we'll be discussing the clinical aspects of the management at uh, 3 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll see you tomorrow when we discuss the clinical presentation and management. Thank you. Thank you. Record.